Good afternoon. I don't mean to interrupt your live shot with Dr. Fauci. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Many familiar faces from yesterday back again. Uh, we are pleased uh, to have Dr. Fauci here with us as part of the president's commitment to have public health experts lead our communication with the American people about the pandemic. Uh, just to give you a bit of a run of show here, uh, Dr. Fauci will speak uh, at the top about the state of the pandemic, the status of vaccines. Uh, he'll take some of your questions. I will play the role of the bad cop when it's time for him to go and get to the work of the American people. And then I will uh, do a topper and I'll answer a bunch of your questions as well. So there's lots to come after this. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna just spend a couple of minutes just uh, summarizing the status of where we are. Uh, and then maybe addressing some of the things that I know are on people's minds. So, first of all, obviously, we are still in a very serious situation. I mean, to have over 400,000 deaths is something that, you know, is unfortunately historic in the very, in the very bad sense. Um, when you look at the number of new infections that we have, it's still at a very, very high rate. Hospitalizations are up. There are certain areas of the country, as I think you're all familiar with, which are really stressed from the standpoint of beds, from the standpoint of the stress on the healthcare system. However, when you look more recently at the seven day average of cases, remember we were going between three and 400,000 and two and 300,000. Right now it looks like it might actually be plateauing in the sense of turning around. Now there's good news in that, but you have to be careful that we may not be seeing perhaps an artifact, an artifact of a slowing down following the holidays. So when we see that, we think it's real. But one of the things, and it's interesting, I'm sort of getting a deja vu standing up here, because I said something like this almost a little bit less than a year ago when we were talking about the, the uh, acceleration of cases in the late winter, early spring of 2020, when we were having New York City metropolitan area being the epicenter of what was going on, that there are always lags, so please be, be aware of that, that when you have cases, and then a couple of weeks later you see it represented in hospitalizations, intensive care, and then a couple of weeks later in deaths. So you have almost a paradoxical curves where you see something plateauing and maybe coming down at the same time as hospitalizations and deaths might actually be going up. So this is something that I just put on your radar screen. It is not an unusual thing to see that sort of thing. The, the other point I want to make is one that we're getting asked a lot regarding questions. And that, that is, what is it about these mutants that you're hearing about? The mutants in the UK, which we know are in about 20 plus states, the, U, the mutants that we're seeing in South Africa and in Brazil. Um, first of all, we need to understand that RNA viruses like coronaviruses mutate all the time. Most of the mutations don't have any physiological relevance with regard to the function of the virus itself. However, every once in a while, you get mutations either singly or clustered in combinations which do have an impact. So what have we learned thus far? And I want to emphasize thus far because we're paying very, very careful attention to this and we take it very seriously. At least from the experience that our colleagues in the UK have had, the one that is in the UK appears to have a greater degree of transmissibility, about twice as much as what we call the wild type original virus. The one that is in South Africa is a bit different and I'll get to that in a second. So it does look like it increases the transmissibility. They say correctly, on a one-to-one -one basis, it doesn't seem to make the virus more virulent or have a greater chance of making you seriously ill or killing you. However, we shouldn't be lulled into complacency about that, because if you have a virus that is more transmissible, you're going to get more cases. When you get more cases, you're going to get more hospitalizations, and when you get more hospitalizations, you're ultimately going to get more deaths. So even though the virus on a one-to-one -one basis isn't more serious, the phenomenon of a more transmissible virus is something that you take seriously. The next thing is, does it change enough 
to interfere with the efficacy of a whole group of monoclonal antibodies that many of you are aware of, the monoclonal antibodies that are being used for treatment in some cases and prevention. Since monoclonal antibodies bind to a very specific part of the virus, when there's a mutation there, it has much greater a chance of obliterating the efficacy of a monoclonal antibody. And we're seeing in the much more concerning um, uh, mutations that are in South Africa, and in some respects Brazil, which is similar to South Africa, that it is having an effect on the monoclonal antibodies. The real question that people are quite clearly interested in is, what is the impact on the vaccine? And so far, literally, we have this new phenomenon that are pre print journals where, where people get data and they put it into a preprint server where it hasn't yet been peer reviewed. But you have to pay attention to it because it gives you good information quickly. Ultimately, it gets confirmed. And we're seeing them coming out over the last few days. And what they're saying is that what we likely will be seeing is a diminution more South Africa than UK. UK is that diminution in what would be the efficacy of the vaccine-induced antibodies. Now, that does not mean that the vaccines will not be effective. And let me explain why. There's a thing called a cushion effect. So if you have a vaccine like the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine that can suppress the virus at a dilution, let's say, of one to a thousand, and the mutant influences it by bringing it down to maybe one to, to 800 or something like that, you're still well above the line of not being effective. So there's that cushion that even though it's diminished somewhat, it still is effective. That's what we're seeing both certainly with the UK, which is very minimal effect. We're following very carefully the one in South Africa, which is a little bit more concerning, but nonetheless not something that we don't think that we can handle. What is the message? Because someone could say, now, wait a minute, if you have the possibility that the vaccines are diminishing in their impact, why are we vaccinating people? No. It is all the more reason why we should be vaccinating as many people as you possibly can. Because as long as the virus is out there replicating, viruses don't mutate unless they replicate. And if you can suppress that by a very good vaccine campaign, then you could actually avoid this deleterious effect that you might get from the mutations. Bottom line, we're paying very close attention to it. There are alternative plans if we ever have to modify the vaccine. That is not something that is a very onerous thing. We can do that given the platforms we have. But right now, from the reports we have, literally as of today, it appears that the vaccines will still be effective against them. With the caveat in mind, you want to pay close attention to it. So, Jim, why don't I just stop there and then maybe just answer some questions on anything else that I said. So, yeah. How helpful would it have been if Amazon got involved with the federal response to COVID-19 before Biden took office? And do you know about any plans or discussions ahead of yesterday? No, I, I don't think I could answer that question. Uh, I'd, I'd be waving my hands about that. Sorry. Well, you know, w one of the new things in this administration is if you don't know the answer, don't guess. <laughs> Just say you don't know the answer. Yeah. Yes. Dr. Fauci, a couple of questions, if I might. I'd like to follow up with you uh, on what you just said about this strain in South Africa. Has that strain made its way to the United States? And, and what, if any, concerns do you have? How much do we understand about it? It's a great question. Thus far, it does not appear at all that the South African strain is in the United States. However, we must be honest and say that the level of comprehensive sequence surveillance thus far is not at the level that we would have liked. So we, we're, we're going to be looking very, very carefully for it. But given the information we have today, it doesn't appear that the South African strain is here. Okay, and if I could just ask you about the effort to distribute the vaccines, because of course, that's what most people want to know. When are they going to get a vaccine? Is the Biden administration starting from scratch with the vaccine distribution effort, or are you picking up where the Trump administration left off? No, I mean, um, 
we certainly are not starting from scratch because there is activity going on in the distribution. But if you look at the plan that the president has put forth about the things that he is going to do, namely get community vaccine centers up, get pharmacies more involved, where appropriate, get the Defense Production Act involved, not only perhaps with getting more vaccine, but even the things you need to get a good vaccine program, for example, needles and syringes that might be more useful in that. So it's taking what's gone on, but amplifying it in a big way. President Biden said that what was left was abysmal, essentially. I mean, is there anything actionable that you are taking from the previous administration? Well, is that delaying your efforts to get the vaccine? I mean, that's the question. No, I mean, we're, we're, we're coming in with fresh ideas, but also some ideas that were not bad ideas with the, with, the, with the previous administration. You can't say it was absolutely not usable at all. So we are continuing, but you're going to see a real ramping up of it. One more final question. You had said that most people will be vaccinated by the middle of 2021. Is that still your expectation? Yes, it is. I mean, I, I believe that the, the goal that was set by the president of getting 100 million people vaccinated in the first 100 days is quite a reasonable goal. And when you get to the point, and, and one of the things that, that I think is, is something we need to pay attention to, and I, quite frankly, have been spending a considerable amount of my own time, is outreaching, particularly to minority communities, to make sure that you get them to be vaccinated and you explain why it's so important for themselves, their family, and their community. If we get 70 to 85 percent of the country vaccinated, let's say by the end of the summer, middle of the summer, I believe by the time we get to the fall, we will be approaching a degree of normality. It's not going to be perfectly normal, but one that I think will take a lot of pressure off the American public. You're one of the few holdovers from the previous administration, this current one. What has been your experience with this new team? And in your view, what would have been different in terms of the trajectory of this outbreak from the start had a team like this been in place at the beginning? Well, I can tell you my, my impression of, of, of what's going on right now, the team. I don't, I don't know if I can extrapolate other things. But one of the things that was very clear as recently as about 15 minutes ago when I was with the president is that one of the things that we're going to do is to be completely transparent, open, and honest. If things go wrong, not point fingers, but to correct them and to make everything we do be based on science and evidence. I mean, that was literally a conversation I had 15 minutes ago with the president. And he has said that multiple times. That you, uh, looking back on, on your comments of the last 10 or 12 months, would like to now, with that sort of license, to, to, to amend or clarify? No, I mean, I, I always said everything on the base. That's why I got in trouble sometimes. I, 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 Yes. You mentioned pharmacies. Uh, the new CDC director said today that the goal of getting vaccinations into pharmacies by the end of next month isn't realistic, as had been previously suggested. When will most Americans be able to, to get a vaccination in their neighborhood pharmacy? Well, I'm, I'm, I didn't hear that comment. Are you talking about Dr. Walensky's comment? I, I didn't hear that comment, so I don't really want to comment on, on the comment. But what she may be saying is that for many people in this country who don't have access to a pharmacy, they may not be able to utilize getting things in the pharmacy. I, I'm not sure. I want to be careful because I'm not sure that's what she said. We just had a conversation about how we're going to get vaccines to people who are in pharmacy desert areas where they don't have easy access to a pharmacy. And that's something we're working on and taking very seriously. Just to be clear, if you are in an area where you do have access to a CVS or a Walgreens, right. when will you be able to, to get a fact that access to this you vaccine know, like you would a flu vaccine? You know, in the spirit of not guessing, I, I really am not quite sure when that will be, but we can get back to you on that. And just on the broader timeline, you mentioned the fall. We just heard the president say, you know, the brutal truth is that it is going to be several more months. Just to be clear, you're saying by the fall, the majority of Americans no. you think will be vaccinated? No, I didn't say that. I said if we get the majority of Americans, 70 to 85 percent vaccinated by then, we could have a degree of herd immunity that would get us back to normal. The concern I have and something we're working on is getting people who have vaccine hesitancy who don't want to get vaccinated because many people are skeptical about that. So we really need to do a lot of good outreach for that. 
I mean, I, I don't know what the best case, the best case scenario for, for me is that we'd get 85% of the people vaccinated by the end of the summer. If we do, then by the time we get to the fall, I think we can approach a degree of normality. Uh, on the mutations that you were talking about, a question about how exactly they increase transmissibility. Are, yeah. is it, does it take less exposure time to get no, it? Or does no, it what it is is that you can do in vitro in a, in a test tube setting, binding an affinity to the receptors, which you have in your nose, in your lung, in your GI tract. The receptor for the virus is called an ACE2 receptor, and the facility or affinity with which a virus binds to that means that it very likely will have a better efficiency of infection and replicate more in the nasopharynx. So that's how you make that determination in the test tube. Then you look epidemiologically and you see a spike going up in the sense of number of cases and they sort of match each other. A virus that has the inability to easily bind to and replicate with your receptors is one that likely will spread easier. Mean that it, you'd have more viral load? You'd, well, you could, yes. It, it, in fact, it would mean because if it binds more easily, it could replicate in the nasopharynx more easily, and it is likely that you would have a higher viral load. Does it make masks less effective in that case? No, it makes it the reason why you absolutely should be wearing a mask. It doesn't necessarily make it less effective if you properly wear a mask, then you'll be okay. And on the UK strain, do you have any any data on how widespread that strain is in, in the United well, States? Well, I think it's in at least 20 states that people have mentioned exactly. The, the, the real question that's going to be asked, is it going to become the dominant strain, or will the strains we already have prevent it from flourishing and being the more dominant strain? But it is here, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, a follow-up on vaccines. Some state and local authorities are saying that they would be able to distribute more vaccines if they had more. Is the Biden administration now trying to increase production by Moderna and Pfizer in the next six weeks? Yeah, as well as to utilize what we hope will be another player in the field, the J&J, &J, Janssen, as well as other of the companies. But also, as the, as the president has said in his plan, to do whatever he can to expand the availability of vaccines, whatever that is. I mean, he said that he's going to just use every possibility, including the, the Defense Production Act. Can you explain the discrepancy between what some states are saying about needing more vaccines and the CDC saying that a lot of vaccine is still remaining on people's or on their shelves? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that that is something that we need to really take a close look at because that is sort of an inconsistent discrepancy. And one of the things we want to do is to find out why that's the case. And if it is the case, particularly the thing that would be most disturbing if there's vaccine lay laying around and people are not using it when others would need it. But I don't know the answer to that question, but we need to look into it. Dr. Fauci, uh, yes. what, you've joked a couple times t today already about the difference in that you feel in being kind of the spokesperson for this issue in this administration versus the previous one. Can you can you talk a little bit about how free, how much different do you feel less constrained? What is the, you know, I mean, you, you for so many times you stood up behind the podium with Donald Trump standing behind you. That was a different that was a different feeling, I sh I'm, I'm sure, than it is today. Can you talk a little bit about about how you feel uh, kind of released from from what you had been doing for the last year? Yeah, but you said I was joking about it. I was very serious <laughs> about it. I wasn't joking. Um, no, actually, I mean, I mean, obviously, I don't want to be going back, you know, over history, but it was very clear that there were things that were said, uh, be it regarding things like hydroxychloroquine and other things like that, that really was an uncomfortable because they were not based on scientific fact. I can tell you, I, I take no pleasure at all in being in a situation of contradicting the president. So it was really something that you didn't feel that you could actually say something and there wouldn't be any repercussions about it. The idea that you can get up here and talk about what you know, what the evidence, what the science is, and know that's it. Let the science speak. It is somewhat of a liberating feeling. I mean, you were basically vanished for a, for a few months uh, there for a while. <laughs> you feel like you're back now? 
I think so. <laughs> well, okay. that's Mike Shear. You don't want to take questions from him. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pachi, so much for joining us. We really appreciate it, and we'll have him back again. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, as I promised, uh, we'll have a full briefing from here. So uh, as you know, uh, just a few moments ago, uh, the president uh, also released a national COVID-19 strategy and signed 10 executive orders and other directives to move quickly to contain the crisis. Underpinning everything the president signed today and everything we do every day will be equity. Some highlights of those actions include an executive order to fill supply shortfalls for vaccinations, testing, and PPE. The president directed agencies to exercise all appropriate authorities, including the Defense Production Act, to accelerate manufacturing and delivering of supplies such as N95 masks, gowns, gloves, PCR swabs, test reagents, and necessary equipment and material for the vaccine. The president also signed a presidential memorandum to increase federal reimbursement to states and tribes for the cost of National Guard personnel, emergency supplies, and the personnel and equipment needed to create vaccination centers. An executive order that established a COVID-19 pandemic testing board to bring the full force of the federal government's expertise to expanding testing supply and increasing access to testing an executive order to bolster access to COVID-19 treatments and clinical care, establishing a comprehensive and coordinated preclinical drug discovery and development program to allow therapeutics to be evaluated and developed in response to pandemic threats. Uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, I had to clear my throat. There's a lot here. Um, he also um, issued an executive order directing the Departments of Education and Health and Human Services to provide guidance on safe reopening and operating for schools, child care providers, and institutions of higher education, an executive order on the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to immediately release clear guidance for employers to help keep workers safe from COVID-19 exposure, an executive order to require mask wearing in airports or certain modes of public transportation, including many trains, airplanes, maritime vessels, and intercity buses. And an executive order establishing a COVID-19 health equity task force, something we had previously announced, but making it official today to provide specific recommendations to the president for allocating resources and funding in communities with inequities in COVID-19 outcomes by race, ethnicity, geography, disability, and other considerations. Uh, these steps, of course, build on the actions we announced yesterday. I had an additional update. Uh, some of you may have seen this come out through last, late last night, uh, but I wanted to share with you that as a result of one of the executive orders President uh, Biden signed uh, yesterday, the Acting Homeland Security Secretary issued a memorandum to review and reset immigration enforcement priorities. For 100 days beginning tomorrow, the Department of Homeland Security will pause removals for certain individuals. This pause will allow the administration to review and reset enforcement policies and ensure that resources are dedicated to the most pressing challenges and that we have a fair and effective enforcement system rooted in responsibly managing the border and protecting our national security and public safety. I had one other item I just wanted to flag for you about something the First Lady is up to. Let me see if I can find that, or I will circle back to it a little bit later. Um, with that, uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Zeke, why don't you kick us off? Thanks, Jen. Um, uh, There's some reporting earlier today about uh, the president's commitment to uh, extending uh, uh, extending New Start. Can you talk about what uh, the president's directive on that front has been? Additionally, um, did he, uh, did he confirm that the president requested reports from the, the new DNI? Uh, for an assessment on potential foreign interference in the 2020 election and also uh, the solar winds act. Mm -hmm. uh, I can confirm that the United States intends to seek a five-year extension of New START as the treaty permits. The President has long been clear that the New START treaty is in the national security interests of the United States. Uh, and this extension makes even more sense when the relationship with Russia is adversarial as it is at this time. Uh, New START is the only remaining treaty constraining Russian nuclear forces and is an anchor of strategic stability between our two countries. And to the other part of your question, um, 
even as we work with Russia to advance U.S. interests, so too we work to hold Russia to account for its reckless and adversarial actions. And to this end, the President is also issuing, issuing a tasking to the intelligence community for its full assessment of the solar winds cyber breach, Russian interference in the 2020 election, its use of chemical weapons against opposition leader Alexei Navalny, and the alleged bounties on U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan. So that's hopefully answered all of it. That was a mouthful. And, and just to change gears for a quick second uh, to COVID and the negotiations with Capitol Hill, how long is the, is the president willing to pursue bipartisanship? Democrats are already talking about a reconciliation process. Is there a, given the critical need for some sort of aid here the president is talking about, is there a deadline at which he's going to, he's giving Republicans, you know, by, you know, is it, is, it, is it February 1st? Is it President's weekend? Uh, by which I'll say, no, we're reduced by reconciliation instead. Well, I'm not going to set any deadlines on our first full day in office, uh, but I will say, and hopefully I'll have more for all of you on this tomorrow, uh, we are going to be uh, increasing our engagement. It's already been ongoing, uh, even before the president was inaugurated yesterday, but uh, hopefully we'll have more to share with you tomorrow on meetings, engagements, um, uh, discussions that will be going on uh, with leaders on Capitol Hill and many members over the course of the next several days. Uh, as I conveyed to all of you uh, yesterday, uh, his preference uh, and priority is a bipartisan package and working with members of both parties uh, to uh, come to agreement on that because he believes that uh, the crises facing the American people uh, as we saw the jobs numbers uh, this morning, the unemployment insurance claims, I should say, we put out a statement by our NEC director in case you didn't see that. Uh, as we've seen in the reports from Dr. Fauci just a few minutes ago, this, is, this crisis is dire uh, and it requires uh, immediate action. And we hope and expect uh, members of both parties to work together to do that. We're also not going to take options off the table. Uh, so we'll, we'll proceed with those discussions over the next couple of days. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, Jen. If I could just follow up on that. There was some reporting that there was going to be a meeting this weekend with a bipartisan group of lawmakers. Can you give us any indication? Is that going to happen with President Biden or with his economic team? Is that your expectation? Well, uh, I think the reporting was around a meeting with uh, NEC Director Brian Deese. I spoke with him earlier today. He is uh, definitely going to be engaging uh, with a range of members and a range of different groups of members from Capitol Hill in the coming days. Uh, I think we were still working to confirm specific meetings before I came out here, and I hope to have more for all of you on that by tomorrow. Okay, and more broadly speaking, Jen, President Biden has proposed this $1.9 trillion package. You already have some Republicans who say, we just passed a stimulus plan. They're not gonna get on board with this, Mitt Romney among them, who says we just passed a program with over $900 billion, and some people say the price tag is just way too big. So how does President Biden expect to get this passed with bipartisan support, and how does that fit into his broader message of bipartisanship, proposing something like this? Well, I think it fits perfectly into his message of bipartisanship. He wants to work with Democrats and Republicans to address the crises that the American people are facing, whether they live in red states or blue states or Democratic uh, Democrats or Republicans. Uh, the package was designed based on recommendations from health experts, from economists. Um, it's been uh, applauded by everyone from Senator Bernie Sanders to the Chamber of Commerce. And there are specific pieces in there that are meant to serve as a bridge for the American people, including a large percentage of it that's for unemployment insurance, uh, uh, funding for vaccine distribution, something that is pivotal, as we've already been discussing here today, for reopening of schools. So part of the discussion we'll be having with members is what, what do you want to cut? Uh, and uh, this is a plan that he feels addresses the crisis at the moment. One quick follow-up on that. The work of the Senate is being held up by this dispute over the filibuster. Where does President Biden come down on that? Does he think that there should not be a filibuster so that the Senate could move forward with its work? Well, the president-elect spoke just yesterday, as you all saw, about uh, the spirit of working together and bipartisanship to confront the four crises facing us. Uh, you've already seen him work with Republicans and Democrats and, and uh, work toward a bipartisan uh, approach to passing packages that will address the crises we're facing. And that certainly is his priority and his preference. Uh, so that's what he'll continue to work on on day two of the administration. Go ahead, Mike Scheer. Okay, see, you can call her. I, I just gave you a hard time. Go ahead. That's fine. Um, so I want to push you a little bit more on, on that question. Mm -hmm. like if, if there's this call for unity that the president made in his speech yesterday, 
but there has so far been almost no fig leaf even to the Republican Party. You don't have a Republican cabinet member like President Obama, Obama and uh, I think President Clinton had. You, you know, uh, the executive orders that he's come out the gate have been largely designed at erasing as much of the Trump legacy as, as you can with executive orders, much of which the Republican Party likes and agrees with. You've put forth a, an immigration bill that has a path to citizenship but doesn't do much of a nod towards the border security. And you've got a $1.9 trillion uh, COVID relief bill that has, as folks have said, already drawn all sorts of criticism. Where is the, where is the actual action behind this idea of bipartisanship and when, when are we going to see one of those, you know, sort of substantial outreaches that says this is something that, you know, the Republicans want to do, too? Well, I guess what I would send back to you, there's a lot in there, so let me do my best here. But, uh, Mike, is, is unemployment insurance only an issue that Democrats in the country want? Uh, do only Democrats want their kids to go back to schools? Uh, do only Democrats want vaccines to be distributed across the country? That's, we feel that that package, he feels that package is designed for bipartisan support. I will also say that we have also had some uh, positive developments um, on our confirmations and our nominees. Uh, last night, as you all saw, uh, his no the president's nominee, uh, now confirmed leader, first female leader of the intelligence community, was confirmed with a vote of 85 to 10, 84 to 10. You can check me on that. But an overwhelming vote. Um, we've, we've seen progress today on, uh, on the nomination and hopeful confirmation of uh, Lloyd Austin. So there is movement um, supported by both uh, sides of the aisle and members of both parties. I think if you talk to Democrat or Republicans on the Hill, which I know many of you do, they will say um, they're not looking for something symbolic. They are looking for engagement. They're looking to have a conversation. They're looking to have a dialogue. And that's exactly what he's going to do. Go ahead, Mike. On that, has the president reached out to congressional leaders to sit down and discuss this relief package? Will he be? How much personal involvement is he going to have in this process? I expect he will be rolling up his sleeves and will be quite involved in this process, Mary. And he was. Yesterday was quite a busy day for him. As you all know, um, his schedule was minute by minute, and his family was here. Uh, but he was involved even before yesterday, having conversations with members of both parties, uh, picking up the phone and, and having those conversations. Uh, he saw, of course, members of both parties. He invited leaders from both parties to join him at church. Obviously, that wasn't really a a discussion about uh, specifics of the bill, but they did. He did have an opportunity to talk about his agenda and working to for uh, working together on his agenda moving forward. But I think you will see him quite involved in the days ahead. But you will also see the vice president uh, quite involved. You will also see um, po uh, policy leaders like Brian Deese and others in the administration quite involved and in having conversations with both Democrats and Republicans. But no plans right now to sit down with them. Well, I, I think we will have more to share with you soon uh, in terms of engagement of many of our senior officials with members of both parties. And on the Defense Production Act, just to be clear, has the administration actually invoked the Defense Production Act? And if so, can you spell out what changes we may see because of this? Which companies are being asked to make what? Well, let me give you a, a very specific example that helped really make it clear for me. Um, uh, one area is to acquire more low, uh, low dead volume syringes, and what that does is these specialized syringes allow pharmacists and vaccinators to extract an extra dose of the Pfizer uh, vial, so making more doses available, of course. Um, it also prioritizes the Defense Production Act raw materials that are used to produce uh, the vaccine, so uh, reducing bottlenecks. Um, and it enables uh, manufacturers, uh, us to empower uh, and invoke, I guess, an uh, action from manufacturers to make sure we have the materials we need to get the vaccines out the door and in the arms of Americans. In terms of, obviously, he signed it this afternoon. Um, I'll have to just circle back with you on what it means, if it's officially invoked in this moment or if it takes some time, and we can, we can circle back with you after the briefing. Go ahead. Um, on stimulus, is the White House drafting a legislative bill? Uh, you mean in terms of the, the what he announced last week, uh, last Thursday? Well, he announced what his specific ideas will be and what his vision is. But right now we're having discussions with members of both parties, as we have for the last week, about uh, what that will look like. 
Okay, so no no bill draft coming out of the White House is what I'm well, saying. Well, um, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to talk to our legislative team about that. I think what was important um, to the president was to outline what his vision would be. This is how the process should actually work, right? The president outlines, here's the, my vision, here's what I think should be in a package. Let's have discussions, uh, let's have engagements with both parties, and let's see what comes out of the sausage making at the other side. Uh, go ahead, Anita. I'll um, come back to you. I'm sorry, I keep missing. But um, just following up on what Kristen asked, I don't think I heard an answer about whether the president supports uh, keeping the filibuster or where he sits on that. Is he has he talked to Senator Schumer about that? I mean, he served there a long time. What are his thoughts on that? I think what I was conveying to Kristen is that uh, the president has been clear. He wants to work with members of both parties and find bipartisan paths forward. And um, I don't have any more conversations to read out for you at this point in time. Specifically answer that, unless I'm not understanding your answer. I don't think I have more, more to add to, to my answer. Okay. And then just on the impeachment trial, um, I know that there was some talk about sort of the Senate doing both both things at the same mm -hmm. time, two things at once. There's some reporting this afternoon that uh, Republicans are pushing to have the impeachment trial start in February. Where do you all stand still now on that? Are you still looking for that, uh, both paths to happen at the same time? Would it be preferable to do that first, or are you okay with, with later, as, as some Republicans are talking about? Well, Anita, I think we, we have been pretty consistent that we believe the timing and the uh, mechanisms for the Congress and the Senate moving forward in holding uh, the former president accountable, we'll leave that to them. And what our biggest priority and focus is, is uh, ensuring that it doesn't delay uh, uh, the Senate, Congress moving forward in uh, consideration and discussion around uh, the COVID relief package that the president proposed last week. Uh, go ahead. Uh, th thank you, Jen. Uh, is the print cooler, I have a question for myself and then a question for someone who cannot be here because oh. of the social distancing sure. policies. My question is this, and it's about unity again. I've heard who, from conservatives who are afraid that the president is going to try to pull back religious conscience exemptions for groups like Little Sisters of the Poor. The president pledged he would do that in July when Little Sisters won a, a, a case in the Supreme Court. Uh, the Health and Human Services nominee, Javier Becerra, uh, pursued that line of going, going after the exemptions as Attorney General of California. What's the president going to do on that? I haven't discussed that particular issue with him. I'm, I'm happy to circle back with you, but I, I don't, there's not a change in his position from what he said earlier this summer. Did you have a, another question? A question from Adam Longa of WUSA 9. He says, we saw the president warmly greet uh, Mayor uh, Bowser during the parade yesterday. She is pushing for the DC statehood measure to be on the president's desk within 100 days. Will the administration get behind this bill and does the president support it? I hate to disappoint you, but I will have to circle back with you on that as well. There's quite a bit going on. I have not discussed D.C. statehood with him in the last 36 hours. Forward to hearing. Okay, <laughs> sounds great. Go ahead and back. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, I wanted to circle back on something COVID-related. Uh, I know the president has obviously made a priority of uh, getting resuming in-person learning in the first 100 days. I wondered, is the administration planning to issue any kind of uniform guidance to states on you know, whether it's reopening schools, reopening businesses, indoor dining, stuff like that? Or are you all planning to just kind of leave it to states to do sort of a patchwork based on their own situations? Well, uh, as Dr. Fauci conveyed, um, our objective is to uh, ensure that health and medical experts are leading uh, the effort in delivering guidance, determining guidance, and also communicating it with the public whenever possible. And any guidance would come, of course, as you know, from the CDC. Uh, we and we will we will of course defer to that. Uh, but part of our priority and our focus here is on uh, providing more uh, engagement with states, uh, more clear guidance uh, from the federal level uh, in terms of how we're planning to operate, what data we're seeing, uh, how, the, how vaccines are being distributed, what we see as the challenges. And that communication has been lacking, as we understand it, from our conversations in the past few months. So that is what we will focus on improving in the months ahead. So would you specifically, are you planning to do you know, daily or weekly calls with states, or how, how are you planning to up the, the communication there? Well, we have a, an entire COVID team, as you know, who are now, most of them are official, and part of their role will be engaging with governors, Democrats and Republicans, uh, mayors, local elected officials, to ha gain a better understanding of what's happening on the ground. Uh, that will be how they're going to be intaking a great deal of information. Obviously, health 
care providers and experts on the ground as well. Uh, we will also do engagement uh, from the level of the president and the vice president as well, because they also want to have that conversation with states uh, and local officials on what they're experiencing, what they see the challenges as, and uh, and how they can be addressed. And you know, that's something I think in President Biden's heart, he is a local elected official still, and and he gets into the weeds of what they're experiencing, and I, I and he will be uh, involved in that himself. Go ahead and that. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Uh, there's a lot of really big things that the administration wants to do: infrastructure, the stimulus. Uh, tax reform. Can you sort of lay out the cadence for us over the upcoming year? How do you envision those three major things playing out? What's the order? When do you think those will, will be taken up? When will they happen? Well, uh, what I can lay out for you on our first full day here is what our initial priorities are. Um, and uh, they revolve around addressing the four crises that the president uh, has stated that the country is facing, including getting the pandemic under control, getting people back to work, addressing our climate crisis, and addressing uh, racial equity. And so, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to ask you, do you think tax reform happens in 2021? I don't really have any predictions for you on that. Um, I, I think at this point in time and for the foreseeable future, uh, addressing the pandemic, getting the pandemic under control, uh, and that linkage to uh, getting people back to work will be uh, his top priority. You stone excel the decision uh, yesterday from the president. What, what would you say to those who have lost their job or will lost their job as a result of that decision? What, what would the message from the president and the White House be? The message of the president and the White House would be that he is – uh, committed. His record will show shows the American people that he is committed to uh, clean energy jobs, uh, to jobs that are not only good, high-paying jobs, uh, union jobs, uh, but ones that are also good for our environment. He thinks it's possible to do both. Uh, he led an effort uh, when he was the vice president uh, to put millions of people to work uh, with those both of those priorities in mind, and he will continue to do that as president. Uh, but he had opposed the Keystone Pipeline back in 2013 uh, when it was uh, when, when there was a consideration of the permit or sorry, I don't think it was 2013. I think it was a little bit after that. Uh, and he's been consistent in his view and he was delivering on a promise he made to the American public during the campaign. Um, go ahead all the way in the back. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about India-US relationship. Uh, what is President Biden's vision of an India-US relationship, the relationship between the world's oldest and world's largest democracies? Well, uh, first I would say that President Biden, uh, who of course has visited India many times, uh, respects and values the long uh, bipartisan uh, successful relationship uh, between uh, leaders in India and the United States. Um, he looks forward to a continuation of that. Obviously, he selected, and uh, and yesterday she was sworn in, um, the first uh, Indian American uh, to serve uh, as president or vice president. It's certainly a historic moment uh, for all of us in this country, but uh, a further, um, you know, cementing of the importance of our uh, relationship. So... Uh, go you. ahead, George. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, two questions, if I could. One, on the, on the Hatch Act, will this administration take that seriously, and do you think it's ever appropriate for this White House to have a political event or a political meeting? Well, as you know, there are some political events that are acceptable, but we certainly take the Hatch Act seriously uh, and will abide by that, and uh, you will not see a political uh, rally on the uh, south lawn of the White House with pres under President Biden. The second one, this, this may sound trivial, but presidents and candidates have some events where it, they're fun for the candidate. The, the big crowd on the acceptance speech at the convention, the big crowd at the uh, inauguration, big rallies. Because of COVID, this president has, has been denied all those. Has he ever been at all wistful about sort of missing the fun parts of, uh, of being a candidate and the inauguration? Not, not, not in front of me, George. I, I will say that even yesterday um, or over the last couple of days, you know, he tried to find a moment of joy uh, with his family and with his grandchildren who bring him great, a great deal of joy and uh, a recognition of uh, 
of course, the great responsibility he has on his shoulders, but a, a, a moment uh, in history uh, that uh, that he was uh, playing a very important part of. So I would say he's been in public office, as you all know, for decades, and he's had many joyful moments. But this moment, serving as president, coming in at a crisis where thousands of people are dying from a pandemic every day, millions of people are out of work, uh, uh, is not really a time for daily joy as the leader of the free world, and he's focused on, on doing his job to get the work done for the American people. Go ahead. Why weren't President Biden and all members of the Biden family masked at all times on federal lands last night if he signed an executive order that mandates masks on federal lands at all times? At the inaugural... At the Lincoln Memorial, yes. I, I think, Steve, he was celebrating uh, an evening uh, of a historic day in our country. And certainly he signed the mask mandate because it's a way to send a message to the American public about the importance of uh, wearing masks, how it can save tens of thousands of lives. We take a number of COVID precautions, as you know here, in terms of testing, social distancing, mask wearing ourselves, as, as we do every single day. But I don't know that I have more for you on it than that. But as uh, Joe Biden often talks about, uh, it is not just important the uh, example of power, but the power of our example. Was that a good example for people who are watching who might not pay attention uh, normally? Well, Steve, I think uh, the power of his example is also uh, the message he sends by sign signing 25 executive orders, including um, almost half of them related to COVID, uh, the requirements that we're all under every single day here to ensure we're sending that message to the public. Yesterday was a historic moment in our history. He was inaugurated as president of the United States. He was surrounded by his family. We take a number of precautions, but I don't think, I think we have big, bigger issues to, to worry about at this moment in time. Go ahead, Anita. Yeah. You mentioned. Oh, sorry, Jeff. Uh, let me go to Jeff and Yeta because I already went to you. If that's okay. Jeff, go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, follow up on New Start. Do you have any indication from Russia that they will object to um, the extension of five years? And has the United States already alerted Moscow about its desire? Uh, well, we have not. Uh, obviously, as you know, a number of our nominees have talked about our intention uh, during their confirmation hearings over the past couple of days of extending New Start. Uh, I don't have any calls to read out for you, but I can check and see if any uh, notifications or discussions have happened this afternoon. And a follow-up on something from yesterday, um, which I think you referred to, that President Biden had said that President Trump left him a very generous note, mm -hmm. and he didn't want to talk about it until he spoke to President Trump. Are President Biden and President, former President Trump going to have a call? There's no call planned. Uh, what he was conveying is that he didn't want to release a private note uh, without having agreement from the former president. Uh, but I wouldn't say he's seeking it through a phone call. He just was uh, even trying to be respectful uh, in that moment of a private letter that was sent. With regard to the former president, has uh, President Biden spoken to Speaker Pelosi at all about the timing of when she plans to bring the impeachment articles to the Senate and how he would like to see this trial proceed. President Biden has been pretty clear about what the focus of his conversations are and what his intention is with his engagements with leaders from both sides of the aisle and in both houses of Congress, including with Speaker Pelosi, someone he's known for quite some time. And that is his intention and focus on getting uh, the uh, COVID package through. Uh, so. He will leave it to her and to uh, now uh, Leader Schumer to determine what the path forward and the timeline will be in holding the former president accountable. Uh, Anita, go back to you. Yeah, you uh, earlier mentioned four priorities of the president. I was surprised to not hear immigration per se in that because yesterday many of the executive orders were about immigration. There were two major agency releases last night about immigration. The bill is being introduced today. Do you not see that as sort of the second big push after the COVID bill? Where do you see that? And I guess I would say, why is it, I was going to ask you, why is it going to be, you know, why is it such a priority after the COVID bill? But you didn't even list it. So I wanted to kind of clarify that and get your thoughts on it. Well, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, read into that other than immigration we consider as part of racial equity um, and part of, a, which is a, a broad issue, but that's how the president has spoken about uh, that crisis over the past several months. And 
Clearly, it is an enormous priority to him because uh, he, we moved forward in announcing the specifics of an immigration bill, an immigration package uh, he is eager to move forward on uh, with Congress uh, on his first day in office. Uh, but as you know, uh, there's been a lot of history on efforts to uh, do comprehensive immigration reform, to do any form of immigration reform. And what we're hopeful is that this will be a moment of reset and a moment to restart discussions on Capitol Hill. There are already a number of co-sponsors who have been announced uh, to have those discussions. There are experts on immigration who have worked on this issue on both sides of the aisle. Historically, it is an issue there that there is bipartisan support, support from the business community, supports from, from a range of outside groups with, uh, with different uh, political tilts, uh, and we're hopeful that that will help propel it forward. Mendez said today on a call, he called it a Herculean, you know, effort to get this through. As you know, it hasn't gone through, as you just mentioned before. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are Republicans grumbling today that there's not more in that bill that they want to see. So is that bill, what do you think the prospect of that bill getting through is? Well, I don't know that I can predict that the first day. I mean, it's only been out for 24 hours. Um, but what was important to the president in the outline of this bill is that it is addressing uh, a couple of areas that he doesn't feel have been effectively done in the past. The last four years, the immigration policy has been based around funding for a wall. That has not worked, even to keep the country safer, even to keep uh, bad actors out. And so his approach is multi-pronged. Uh, it is to do smart security, security that will help address uh, and, and use technology to address key border crossings, uh, address ports of entry uh, more effectively and efficiently, and putting that oversight in the hands of the uh, Department of Homeland Security. It will also um, help address root causes of uh, migration, uh, and that hasn't been in past bills, as you probably well know, Anita. It was not in the bill in 2013, but it's something that he has been an advocate for in his time in public office. And it also has a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million uh, undocumented immigrants who are living in the country. There are components of here in the bill that address a lot of the issues um, that have, have not uh, been addressed in the past, and, and certainly um, the components of it uh, that, uh, that, make, that are talk about smart security are the kind of border security that we think um, is essential and more effective than what we've seen over the past couple of years. Go ahead. Oh. Can I go to Zeke first and then to you, Kristen? Go ahead. I just wanted to follow up on a question I asked the President uh, an hour or so ago about the 100 million vaccines in the first 100 days target. That's roughly a, a per diem basis of where, where the vaccinations are right now. Can you just elaborate a little bit why the President isn't setting the bar a little bit higher? He may be required another nudge. Just, just to explain to the American people, when they see these statistics of, you know, one tracker had 1.6 million yesterday, you know, why isn't the President shooting just a little bit higher given the magnitude of the crisis here? Well. None of us are mathematicians, myself included, so I asked our team to do a little math on this. So the Trump administration was given 36 million doses when they were in office for 38 days. They administered a total of about 17 million shots. That's about uh, less than 500,000 shots a day. What we are proposing is to double that to about 1 million uh, shots per day. And we, we have uh, outlined this goal and objective in coordination and consultation with our health and medical experts. So it, it is uh, ambitious. It's something that we feel is bold um, and was called that certainly at the time. Uh, and we're working overtime to help to achieve it, try to achieve it. But is the president trying to, we, obviously we try to exceed that if possible. Is it, is it, is it possible we may see in, in, a, in a couple of weeks or months that, that the president would up that goal? Well, Zeke, there are a lot of factors that go into um, determining how many shots can get into the arms of Americans. We feel um, confident we can achieve this goal. Uh, obviously, there are other vaccines that are being uh, considered at this point in time by the FDA. Um, there is funding that will be needed for distribution. There are a number of steps that will help expedite at some point in time. But right now, our focus is on uh, what many health, health and medical experts have consistently called a bold goal. I will note also that some of the reporting this morning, which Kristen asked about earlier, was that the Trump administration left us with no plan. It's hard for them to both be exactly true at the same time. Um, and our team has been putting together a plan, our own plan, as Dr. Fauci talked about, for some time to achieve this goal. Uh, but he also mentioned that there are a number of challenges. It's not just about lining people up 
as you all know, but for people watching uh, in a football stadium and giving them shots. We have to overcome vaccine hesitancy. We have to get to health uh, communities where there are, they don't have access to health centers. That was outlined. A number of steps to address that were outlined in the president's plan today. Um, but, um, you know, we, this is a bold goal. We're going to work every day to achieve it, and we'll build from there. There's a lot more of the administration to go from there and more work on COVID to be done. Go ahead, Kristen. Should President Biden is reversing a number of former President Trump's policies, and we're seeing some of former President Trump's staffers be placed on leave or be reassigned. Is there an attempt to purge Trump officials? Well, there's a new administration, so obviously there are a number of new officials in place. Uh, I know there was some reporting, for example, and I don't know if this is who you're referencing, so you tell me if not, uh, of the head of the NLRB. Um, that's an individual who was not um, carrying out the, um, uh, you know, anyone would tell you, not just from our administration, uh, the objectives of uh, the NLRB. And so they were, they're no longer in their position. And we'll, we'll take make those decisions as needed. So not an effort writ large, but you're assessing, reassessing individuals. Well, Kristen, as you know, when a new administration comes in, there's a massive changeover in political appointees and nominees and, and people who will serve in a variety of roles. There are some people, um, Christopher Ray is an example, I'll just bring him back up, who will continue to serve in his role. Uh, but uh, we have great value for career officials, for uh, the officials who have been the heart and soul of agencies across government since long before the Trump administration, but who have served through the Trump administration as well. On COVID, that's the question. Mm -hmm. uh, did the transition officials know before yesterday that Amazon wanted to get involved in such a meaningful way? We saw, uh, not that I'm aware of. I'm, I'm happy to check. I mean, when the reporting came out, I asked the question, and uh, I think uh, internally, and you know what was conveyed to me, and I don't think we discussed this yesterday, was that we've had a lot of outreach, um, some privately, some publicly, from a range of businesses and private sector entities, and we certainly welcome that, and uh, we'll be considering all of those offers and what makes the most sense in our uh, plans and proposals. So, because there are some Trump officials saying they were never offered help from Amazon, and so they're essentially saying they think this was a political call for Amazon to wait while lives were hanging in the balance, but you're saying that is not the case. I'm not aware of the timeline of when Amazon reached out. That sounds like a question for Amazon to me. Jen, Go ahead. what did you think about all the pardons that Trump um, handed out on his way out the door? And do you know if the DOJ or anyone is reviewing any of those? Uh, well, as you know, we nominated an attorney general just a couple of weeks ago, Merrick Garland. Uh, we're eager to get him confirmed um, in the coming weeks, hopefully soon. Uh, we, Our view on the pardons, uh, Jennifer, is that it's not the way, it's not a model for how a Biden Justice Department would work. It's not a model, I should say, for how uh, President Biden uh, would use his own power. He would use his own power far more judiciously. Uh, but we are looking forward. Um, and uh, most important for us and for him is that uh, the Justice Department, uh, as we look ahead, is independent, uh, makes decisions of their own accord, including re the review of any investigations or uh, judicial steps that have been taken. Thank you, Jen. Jen. Thank you. Okay, we, uh, I think we're about to conclude it here, but because it's my second day, let's take two more questions. Go ahead in the back. Attorneys. Yes. Is, is the president going to listen to the pardon attorney? Um, president uh, Bush told President Obama that he should use the pardon power early on. But we know that, uh, that, that the pardon power has been in disrepute in the last week because of President Trump's pardons. What is, is President Biden going to try to use the, the power quickly? Or, I mean, you said judiciously. What, what, what's his take going to be. Well, judiciously, and I'm not saying you're conveying this, but just for clarity, it's not meant to in convey speed. It's just meant to convey how he approaches it. As you know, he has a long history on uh, judicial issues, having served as the chairman of the Judiciary Committee many years ago. Uh, but on day two, I, I don't have any th prediction for you in terms of how he would use a par pardon attorneys or the role, but he has great respect for and value for uh, independence, as you know, um, and for the role of the judiciary 
um, and the independence of that role. Okay, last last Thanks, actual yeah, question. I, Sorry, I, I, I appreciate it. And I'm going to bounce off stuff here of conversations that may or may not have happened. Can you tell us has President Biden spoken to the Fed Chair Jay Powell? If he hasn't, does he have any plans on speaking to him at any point in the near future? And generally speaking, how does the President view the stewardship of the Fed Chair during this economic crisis? I don't have any calls to read out for you or to predict for you uh, with the Chairman of the Federal Reserve. Uh, uh, he clearly has a great deal of respect and value for the Federal Reserve and the role they've played historically, given he nominated the former chair to serve as the first female Treasury Secretary. Um, but I don't have anything more for you. I'm conventure to get more for you from our economic team. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks,